Welcome back to the Pilot's Lounge. On today's episode, hope you brought your nerd hat, throw it on alongside us because we are diving into NASA's Artemis program. From wherever you are listening, grab your cup of coffee, sit back, and thanks again for joining us on the Pilot's Lounge. But before we dive into today's episode, a few words from our brothers in flight over at the Hangar Z podcast. What's going on, Bartellian? This is John Gray host of the Hangar Z podcast. We love the Pilot's Lounge podcast and know you do as well. Hey, when you're done here, come check out the Hangar Z podcast. We're the first and only podcast promoting the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. You can find us at hangarzpodcast.com or anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Be sure to head over to www.brotalian.com. We just dropped the Brotalian Rotor Development Wooly Hoodie Limited Stock. I think only 14 are available. So if you want one, go grab one at www.brotalian.com. So here recently, a lot of people's eyes have been turned back to space with the sharing of the Artemis One launch attempts uh, across social media platforms. It's been in the in the news, and a lot of questions have been raised about you know what is the Artemis program. Uh, outside of just watching a cool rocket launch uh, on YouTube or whatever platform that people are trying to watch it live on. Well, that's what we're going to dive into. So Artemis 1's first attempted launch was on 29 August, and then a second attempted launch was on September 3rd. We'll dive in a little bit uh, to what postponed both of those launches. The next launch attempt for Artemis 1 is actually scheduled on uh, 27 September. So here pretty soon in a couple weeks, and... My hope is that they're able to get it off. I mean, I'm sure everybody's hope is that they're able to get it off the ground. So what is Artemis 1? Artemis 1 in particular is an uncrewed test flight around and beyond the moon, which was originally uh, scheduled to launch no sooner than late September of 2022. Artemis 2 and subsequent launches will be a little bit different. Artemis 2 is going to be a crewed flight, basically the same thing as Artemis 1, only they are going to have... Uh, humans on board, uh, and it's going to take them around the moon and the farthest in space that humans have ever been before. Artemis 3 is a mission that's intent is to land the first female astronaut and first astronaut of color on the moon uh, to spend a week performing scientific studies on the lunar surface. So Artemis 3 is actually going to be pretty cool because it's going to be NASA's first crewed moon landing mission since Apollo 17 in 1972. So it's the first time we will be back on the moon since 1972. Long time coming, and hopefully uh, it provides some good data. Now, the overarching goal with the Artemis program goes well beyond the moon, which is kind of why they're testing the limits, going a little bit further, and then going to be doing some research on the moon, basically to set the stage for future operations. Now, Again, while the Artemis space missions are mainly focused on lunar exploration, NASA's long-term goals are pretty ambitious. Using the technology and research developed during the Artemis space flights and during the program in its entirety, NASA intends to launch future crewed missions to Mars. We can kind of build a hypothesis that they are going to do something very similar after the success of the Artemis program and, you know, beginning um, a kind of a more permanent base. And we'll get into a little bit about uh, what their intent is in terms of assets around and on the moon, all to pave the way uh, to begin sending things from the moon out further towards Mars. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the the show for all mankind, uh, and I'm not going to dive into a huge advertisement blurb from them, but go watch it. Uh, it's really interesting reading the Artemis program's kind of design and the overall intent long term in having watched that show, because a lot of it is relatively similar, almost to the point where it makes me think that the show kind of looked at the program and said, oh, well, we're going to kind of, you know, use this to, to build a series. Anyway, I digress. Diving a bit further into Artemis 1. Now, there's two huge components uh, that are making this all possible. Primarily the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System rocket, or also known as the SLS. So the Orion system itself is actually the command module needed to transport the astronauts themselves. It's equipped with life support systems, their shuttle interfaces, uh, so the crew module, a service module, a whole launch abort system, all of that kind of stuff to be able to basically get them where they need to go in, in low orbit. Uh, the next component is the SLS or the space launch, the space launch system rocket, say that five times fast. So the space launch system itself is actually pretty cool because it's somewhat 
def- designed to be a modular system. Um, and it's kind of broken down into blocks. So block one, two, three, four, so on, depending on what they are actually utilizing the launch, the space launch system for itself. The overall design is actually intended for deep space missions and will send the Orion capsule or other cargo to the moon, which is nearly 1000 times farther than where the international space station resides in low or uh, low earth orbit. So it's pretty cool. The high, the high performance rocket travels at a speed of 24,500 miles per hour and should get it. I say should again, we're going to find out get it all the way uh, where it needs to go to the moon in the orbit. Uh, aside from the blocks, or I should say, regardless of what block of SLS is being utilized, all of them uses a core stage with four RS-25 engines, uh, which is pretty cool. So what that translates to with block one, which is being used on Artemis one, it can send more than uh, 27 metric tons or 59,500 pounds to, er- to orbits beyond the moon. It's going to be powered by twin uh, five-segment solid rocket boosters and four RS-25 liquid, liquid propellant engines. After reaching space, the uh, interim cryogenic propulsion stage, known as the ICPS, will send the Orion rocket or the Orion module uh, onto the moon itself. So the first three Artemis missions are going to be using Block One, the Block One rocket with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which is pretty cool. The Block 1 Bravo crew vehicle actually will use a new, more powerful exploration upper stage to enable a little bit more, quote-unquote, ambitious missions. Uh, So the Block 1 Bravo vehicle can, in a single launch, carry the Orion crew vehicle along with large cargoes for exploration systems needed to support a sustained presence on the moon. So it can send a lot of stuff that's going to equate to 38 tons or 83,700 pounds to deep space, including the Orion module and its crew. If it launches with cargo only, uh, it's got a pretty high volume payload, uh, fairing itself to be able to send larger exploration systems to the moon and Mars for science, uh, spacecraft like robotics and things of that nature, uh, on solar system exploration missions. So the block two is going to be a little bit different Uh, It's going to be able to provide 9.5 million pounds of thrust and is going to be the primary workhorse for sending cargo to the moon. So those subsequent uh, Artemis missions and potentially programs beyond Artemis, uh, because the intent is to send cargo to the moon, Mars, and other deep space uh, destinations. The Block 2, to kind of put that into perspective numerically, will be designed to lift more than 1,000, I'm sorry, 101,400 pounds to deep space. And again, it's an evolvable design that they're going to be able to pair with uh, different additions and modular components to be able to meet the needs of whatever program intent it is supporting. But more specifically to Artemis 1, which is the first integrated flight of the Space Launch System and Orion, it'll be in the Block 1 configuration, which stands 322 feet tall. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty and is going to weigh 5.75 million pounds. During launch and ascent, the space launch system will provide 8.8 million pounds of maximum thrust, which is actually 15% more thrust than the Saturn V rocket. The Saturn V rocket specifically um, was used during the Apollo program in the 1960s and 1970s and was also used uh, to launch the Skylab space station. But obviously the primary driving factors for developing a new space launch or a new rocket system is going to be the very different overall long-term intent of the programs themselves with not only carrying more cargo and a more sustainable uh, type of mission, or I should say a mission to sustain operations in space and orbit around the moon and on the moon, but also to set up for farther deep uh, deep space exploration, whereas the Saturn V's overall design architecture was really centered around getting people to the moon getting them in orbit and things of that nature. Once in space, uh, they're going to jettison rocket boosters, fairings, a launch abort system, and cut off the Corsage main engine uh, with that separation. They're also going to go into what's called a perigee raise maneuver, uh, where they go into basically low earth orbit, do a systems check, whatever solar panel adjustments they need. And they're actually going to then execute as they're moving around orbit, similar to kind of like a slingshot effect, they're going to do a translunar injection burn or a TLI burn. Uh, So the maneuver lasts for approximately 20 minutes. 
and is going to get them on their way going on the trajectory they need to pick up and orbit uh, for the moon. So after they've done that translunar injection burn, they're going to go into that uh, ICPS or interim cryogenic propulsion stage separation disposal, uh, which basically commits the Orion module to the moon. Uh, after that occurs, they are, they are on their way and the trajectory is trajectory is set. Uh, and then basically after that uh, ICPS occurs, really until they get there, it's just going to be what's called outbound trajectory correction burns where it's just kind of keeping them on course. Once that occurs, everything else from that point is to basically get them into lunar orbit. Uh, now, the whole mission duration is approximately 26 to 42 days. Uh, so their outbound transit from Earth is approximately 18 to 14 days. Their stay in DRO, uh, which is going to be distant retrograde orbit, is approximately 6 to 19 days, and that's distant retrograde orbit around the moon. And then the return transit is going to be about 9 to 19 days. So basically the way that that is going to work is that they will once again perform somewhat of what could be considered similar to a slingshot maneuver in what's called a return powered fly by leaving that uh, distant retrograde orbit, passing in closer to the moon, and then basically executing a burn prep and setting up their trajectory to get back into Earth's atmosphere from there. So again, it's it's a lot of a lot of words and a, and a lot of parts and pieces. Uh, but on the YouTube video, I'm I'm hoping to kind of get a uh, visual up to make it a little bit more some or make it make sense somewhat more, I should say, because there's a lot of terms. But all in all, if you can visualize this whole thing, basically performing a big figure eight around Earth and the Moon, and the the far side of that figure eight being essentially set up to slingshot them and get them to the other orbital location. That is essentially what is in very, very layman's terms happening. Now, I'm not going to dive specifically into LEO and GEO, which is low Earth orbit as well as uh, geosynchronous orbit. But if you want to understand more about how orbital mechanics and orbital maneuvers work, go on YouTube, search them. There's a ton of great information out there, as well as an amazing class produced by Matthew M. Pete on spacecraft dynamics and control, specifically lecture eight, which goes into impulsive orbital maneuvers. And it breaks down the math and science behind all of it. It is incredible to read if you are into that kind of thing. Again, I told you at the very beginning, grab your nerd cap. I've got mine on uh, because space is freaking cool, man. In our lifetime, to have people going back to the moon and potentially Mars in a lot of our lifetimes is, is pretty incredible. So Artemis II uh, kind of switching gears into the next Artemis uh, step or next Artemis gateway. Artemis II is going to be the same thing that I just talked about, only the intent is for it to be manned. Uh, the first one is actually pretty cool. And Artemis I, they're sending up uh, uh, what's being called a Moonakin uh, named Campos, which is going to be testing out the first generation Ocri uh, Orion crew survival system spacesuit which the astronauts are going to be wearing on Artemis 2 and 3. And they're going to be placing sensors all over uh, campus to provide data on what human crew members may experience in flight. Presumably things like heat and uh, moisture, oxygen concentration, things of that nature. So that is really cool uh, that we have the technology to be able to do that now. Now, before we dive into Artemis 3, which is kind of the, the big launch that is going back to the moon. Let's talk briefly about the Lunar Gateway. So the Lunar Gateway is currently slated to launch in November of 2024, but it's pretty cool because it is a huge conglomerate of all sorts of systems produced by all sorts of agencies. Uh, you've got a logistics module uh, that has been built by SpaceX. You've got a habitation and logistics outpost known as Halo that has been built primarily by Northrop Grumman in a you know, obviously in conjunction with NASA and other agency agencies. Uh, and then obviously on top of that, you've got a power and propulsion element or PPE produced by Maxar. And again, like this has been a pretty cool um, overall investment into the commercial sector uh, for production of parts that are going to be used in a, in a very 
uh, what's typically been kind of close held thing to NASA. Uh, so the co-manifest of PPE and Halo launch vehicle, which isn't actually talked about a whole lot, is also going to be produced uh, by SpaceX. So again, all this stuff is going to be launched up prior to Artemis 3 occurring. And then going into Artemis 3, uh, which again is the first is set to be the first moon landing since Apollo 17 in 1972 is going to be launching kind of doing similar uh, to the other stuff going from around the Earth's orbit into the moon's orbit and actually docking with that lunar gateway. Uh, and they're going to be remaining at the gateway for 30 days. The human landing system, which is, uh, you know, basically a landing vehicle will then take two astronauts down to the moon's South pole, which is pretty cool. It's a region that uh, has not yet been visited by humans of any sort uh, for any, you know, any country or agency per se. And they're going to spend a week down there. Uh, the whole purpose is to spend a week exploring the surface and perform, you know, as I said before, a variety of scientific studies, including sampling water ice uh, first detected on the moon back in 1971. So again, with the overarching goal of going to Mars in the distant future and setting up a more permanent base, both on the lunar, uh, I should say both with the lunar gateway and on the surface of the moon, that begs the question, what comes after Artemis three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Uh, well, actually NASA, uh, is primary fo their primary focus is on one to three for now, but they are also looking ahead and actually have already awarded contracts for boosters, uh, on rockets up to Artemis 13. So really pending any massive, uh, changes to budget restrictions or overarching goals, uh, for strategy as it pertains to space, we're on set, you know, we're, we're set on a course to really be seeing this Artemis program probably over the next at least 15 years, if not significantly more. Now, I'm not sure if a new program name is going to come out uh, once, you know, they've established whatever they need to on the surface of the moon and in the orbit of the moon and are intending to go to Mars, I'm not sure if that is going to be under the same Artemis program name or if they are going to uh, initiate a whole new program. Given the overall intent of Artemis is specifically to put people back on the moon and to conduct exploration and research on the moon and in the orbit, I would venture to say that it, because that is that program's overall mission and intent, a new program will be released uh, with the intent to uh, going further into space and potentially to the surface of Mars with humans. Now, I know a lot of this information has been pretty dense. Uh, there's, there's just so much information out there, and it's hard to really talk a lot about it at a very uh, layman's term level because a lot of this stuff is still beyond the comprehension of myself. I'm not a rocket scientist, and I'm not an astronaut. But it is cool to get some basic knowledge of, of the science and of the th people and of the technology that is going into this massive effort uh, to really you know, set the stage for something really incredible that I would hope, and I'm sure all of us hope that we see in our lifetime. Uh, if you want to know more, absolutely check out nasa.gov, go to the Artemis program page. Uh, that's where most of this uh, information came from. And I didn't really dive a lot into the Artemis base camp and some of the exploration ground systems. Uh, one, because I want to allow for future content here way down the road when those are utilized. Uh, but two, a lot of those aren't necessarily tied to a specific program yet, and it'd be more so speculation than anything and even talking about them right now. If you are a rocket scientist or astronaut listening to this episode, please feel free to drop in a comment uh, or a review telling us how little we know or how messed up I was on trying to explain uh, how incredible this program is and kind of the maneuvers and what they are set to do. Uh, but we hope this kind of painted a, a brief picture again. September 27th, Artemis 1 is set uh, for a third launch attempt. Hopefully they can get it so that it can progress these uh, different programs being Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 closer to reality. We appreciate you joining us from wherever you are at. Thank you again for joining the Pilot's Lounge. Be sure to go to www.brotalian.com. Check out the Brotalian Rotor Development Wooby Hoodie. Uh, very limited stock on there. I think there's only 14 available. So if you want one, head on to www.brotalian.com. Snag one before it is too late.